Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our Birds of Newfoundland webinar series. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about birding by ear. And this is, in fact, our final evening of the series for 2023. So um, it's great to see folks out again for the last one. And um, hopefully we get a few more trickling in as uh, the hour goes on by here. But we'll get started. For anybody who is new tonight, uh, my name is Jenna McDermott. And with me, I have Catherine Dale. She's going to be manning the chat and helping out with any technological problems, all that sort of good stuff. Um, so the two of us are here to teach you all about birding by ear. Um, Catherine and I work for an organization called Birds Canada. And this is a nonprofit organization and we have offices all across Canada. Um, our mission is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. And so to do that, um, we run a lot of different programs that are basic, are mostly citizen science-based. So that basically means that regular people who are interested in birds in this case, um, collect information and filter that into our different programs so we can use it for bird conservation. Um, and we have an incredible amount of volunteers who share their time and energy with us and over 70,000 people each year help us um, running these programs, which is really incredible um, all across the country. So right now in Newfoundland, we have two different citizen science projects going on. The first one is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And I won't go into much detail about it if you are interested in participating or learning more about it. Um, we did just do a Atlasing for Beginners webinar. I think that was last week and you can find the recording of it on our website. Um, and I do just want to uh, quickly say that um, since the Atlas is run through donations and grants, if you would like a way to show your appreciation for the series of webinars this winter, uh, we welcome donations of any size so you can see how to find that information there in green on the slide. Um, and I'll have that info at the end slide as well and um, probably send it in a follow-up email. Um, this is of course not required, but um, we definitely appreciate any donations um, of any size. So thank you in advance if you decide to do that. Um, so yes, the Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, basically, we are intending to map the distribution and abundance of all of the birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. The huge project, it also relies a lot on volunteers, but we also send out some um, field staff in the summers to help fill in some holes. Um, and so you can see, for example, this is a, a map of where the greater yellow legs have been found so far in our Atlas data set. The second program that we run in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey. And that's actually happening right now. Um, it goes until May 15th. Uh, Catherine heads that up. And if you want to know more information on that, we also have um, another webinar that we have already done called An Evening of Owls um, that can tell you more information about it. Or feel free to just email us and we can talk you through it, uh, whether you want to be involved or just want to know more about it. And before we get started into today's content, um, I want to acknowledge that the lands that we are running those programs on are the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Beothic, whose people have been erased forever, and also the Mi'kmaq people. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and these people have been protecting and stewarding the land since time immemorial. And through our programs, we hope to um, also add to the stewardship that goes into uh, protecting, protecting the island of Newfoundland. And um, yes, we so we really uh, just hope to assist in that stewardship um, that these people have been doing forever. And if you're interested in learning what um, indigenous lands you are living on or visiting um, or the treaties that cover them, the website that I have here on the slide, nativeland.ca, is really a good place to start on that journey. And just uh, last thing before we get into it, um, I would like to thank all of our partners and funders who 
um, support us either monetarily or through uh, donations of their time who uh, really uh, allow us to succeed in putting our programs off as well. So thanks to all of these supporters and funders. And now we get to begin. Um, so today is a little bit of a different layout than we've had for the majority of these webinars this winter, um, because we're not going through big lists of species or anything like that. Um, to start, we're really going to begin by talking about why birds make sounds and what different kinds of sounds they make. Then I'll actually be showing you a video clip um, for a few minutes that one of my uh, old colleagues has made um, because he really does a great job of describing the basics of birding by ear. Um, then we'll come back together and um, I'll show you how you can visualize bird song. And then we'll go through a few more common species that you might already know and we'll practice sort of how to pick out sounds. And then we'll talk about technology for bird song, have a little anonymous quiz, and then I'll let you know some resources. And as always, I'll send out a follow-up email with um, most of this info or any particular information at the end. Um, so you don't need to go writing everything down. So let's go, uh, get into the different kinds of sounds that birds make. So I'll begin by talking about songs. Each species has its own song, which is distinguishable to others of its species, um, as well as to humans. Um, and sometimes the songs are easily distinguishable because they're very unique. Um, and sometimes they are difficult to distinguish from other species because they're quite similar. And uh, songs are really what you're gonna focus on when you begin learning. Um, to identify birds by sound. So songs are usually complex and they're often uh, melodic and um, they have notes together in different sections, they have repeated parts and they're pretty uh, musical. So I'll just give you an example here of a black-throated green warbler song. This little guy up in the corner there. So that's the black throated green warbler and his song is quite distinct um, for the birds of Newfoundland and it's pretty unlike other species here. So it's a good one, a good one to um, start learning because it's not easily confused with other ones. An interesting thing to note is that uh, individual birds can have slight variations on the species song, so you won't necessarily hear two birds of the same species sounding exactly alike. Um, everyone has their own distinct voice, which is really cool, cool to hear. So when we're talking about bird songs, they are used for primarily two different things. The first one is mate attraction. So because singing is quite energetically expensive, it can actually indicate to females how healthy a male who's singing is um, and how good at defending a territory he'll be. So being a good singer is actually incredibly important to have a successful breeding season for a bird. The second thing that bird song is used for is territory defense. And birds will sing to tell other individuals that they own a certain section of habitat. So individuals actually can recognize the songs of their neighbors and between them, they've already decided on their territory boundaries. And so he'll sing back to his neighbor's songs. But if a new bird arrives whose song he doesn't recognize, that might um, spark a more physical altercation because that invading individual might be looking to take over a part of his territory. So in this way, um, knowing the individual songs of his neighbors, a bird can save energy uh, by not chasing every single bird that's singing all the time. Um, and this is actually why it's really important for us as humans to not use bird song to attract birds uh, just so that we can look at them because it actually costs them a lot of energy to respond to us because they think that we are an invading bird um, and it can um, keep them from their regular daily activities. When we're talking about bird song, 
The timing of that is typically during the breeding season um, or just before, just after. And then in the time of day, they're mostly singing in the dawn chorus or early morning. And then some species are also singing um, at dusk or just before dark. Another type of bird sound is a call. So we listened to the song of the black third degree warbler in the last slide, and this is its call. I'll show that to you. So as you can see, it's really um, simple and short and quite difficult to learn because a lot of species calls are really quite similar um, in that they're one little note, um, they are, it's hard to tell the difference in quality, that sort of thing. So again, when you're learning to identify birds by ear, you're going to start learning to identify the songs first. Um, but for birds themselves, the calls are useful for a lot of different reasons. <coughs> Sorry. And um, the first of these is to maintain contact between individuals. So um, we could have a mated pair, a male and a female, and they'll uh, use different calls to maintain contact as they're going about their business feeding um, or during flight and migration. Um, they'll also use calls or chicks will use calls to beg for food from their parents. So they actually beg to convince their parents to feed them like the, these Northern flickers who are poking their head out of the nest cavity here. Um, so I'll let you listen to what they sound like. So as you can see, um, they're pretty insistent um, in begging for food. And in a really interesting study in Europe, it was shown that chicks that begged louder were actually provided more food by their parents. So um, this particular type of call is really important for young birds. Um, different types of calls can also be used to sound an alarm uh, because of a predator being nearby, and that can either prompt the young, young birds, if it's breeding season, to hide uh, or leave the nest or uh, make themselves more difficult to find um, or alert other adults in the area as well of a predator. Um, and calls are different from songs uh, in one final way because they can be used all year round, these different types of calls, or at least some of the different types of calls. And you'll also hear calls all day rather than only mostly in the morning or evening. The last type of bird sound that I'll talk about tonight are non-vocal ones. So this are, these are typically sounds made by feathers um, or other parts of the body, but not um, through their voice. And one of the most common ones that you'll hear in Newfoundland is the sound of a Wilson snipe feathers. So I'll let you listen to that first. I'll just play that again. So that sound isn't made from its voice. It's made from the tail feathers of the Wilson snipe, who's up in the top corner there, and is uh, air passing through his tail feathers and is part of a mating display for females. So um, in that case, um, the Wilson snipe is using the feather sound as a type of song as well uh, for mate attraction. We also have a picture here of a ruffed grouse and ruffed grouse are another one who make sounds with their feathers. So they drum their wings. And to me, it sounds kind of like the low thumping of a generator starting kind of far away. And I actually feel it more in my chest than actually hearing it with my ears because um, it's such a low sound. And the rough grouse is also using this sound for territorial defense and mate attraction. So again, it functions as their kind of song. Um, we also have non-vocal sounds produced by the beak. So birds will clack their bills um, in irritation or anger at times, but one that everyone is mostly familiar with are the sound of woodpeckers drumming on a tree. 
So they'll drum on uh, hollow trees, on hydro poles, on maybe the siding of your house, um, anything that makes a loud noise that can uh, echo around. And they're also using that as a part of territorial display or to attract mates as well. So again, it's functioning as kind of like a song. And so because all of these ones that I've mentioned here function as a song, they're being used during mostly the breeding season rather than year round. Um, an interesting thing about bird song is that um, species will have a, a different variation sometimes depending on the location. So they do have a dialect. Uh, different species have dialects. So if you are listening to recordings of birds from different areas outside of Newfoundland, or if you're traveling outside of Newfoundland and you see a bird but doesn't sound like the one that you know from home, um, that's because they do have these different dialects. Um, so a good example of this is the white-throated sparrow. So you can see his picture there. In Western Canada uh, or the Western boreal forest, the uh, white-throated sparrow has started singing a different sounding song. So in Newfoundland, it sings, you could say, oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. And in uh, the Western, the Western birds sing a different variation where they cut off one of the syllables in the Canada and they sing, oh, canna, canna, canna. So I'll let you listen to the Western one first. So you can hear it at the end, it, it was just doing two syllables at the end. And then here's the Newfoundland one in comparison. So he's saying Canada, Canada, Canada at the end. Um, so that's just one example of a species that sounds different off of the island. Um, but there's other ones as well. So just be aware that if you're listening to recordings or traveling, um, things may sound a little bit different and that is to be expected. So we might wonder, you know, why do we even want a bird by ear? And I assume most of you have some interest in that already because otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight um, on this Monday evening. But um, let's consider this picture here. You're in this wetland and you can see a bird sitting on the bush close to you. But the other areas are kind of far away, but you can hear uh, birds in lots of different other areas. So um, there's actually statistics that come from a study in a forest in North Carolina that says that 75% of the birds that they found were detected by sound alone, whereas only 3% of birds were detected by sight alone. So of course those numbers will change depending on the habitat or where you are, um, but you're generally going to hear many, many more birds than you will see. Um, so learning birdsong is really just opening up a whole different world of um, increased bird activity, I guess. Um, and I personally get a huge amount of enjoyment knowing what I what it, what birds are around me, even when I can't see them. Um, one thing I really like about you know camping in the summertime is I could be laying in my tent in the morning, my eyes shut, and I can still. Be listening to all of the birds singing around me and be like, oh, there's a white throated sparrow over here, there's a hermit thrush over here, there's a black capped chickadee over there, and you're not even getting out of bed yet. Um, it's super fun. <laughs> um, and additionally, uh, learning to bird by ear is also a great way for people who are visually impaired to get involved with birding. Um, so it's really uh, quite accessible for um, those who are limited by sight. Okay, so I am going to pop into this video uh, that Andres, who used to work for Birds Canada as well, created um, because he does such a good job of describing the basics of birding by ear. So we're going to listen um, for around seven minutes, I think, to this, and then we'll move on uh, back together here. So I'll mute myself and I'll let you all listen to this. Birding by ear lesson six using sound to identify birds.
Bird identification is the ability to recognize and pay attention to detail. In this session, you will learn the main elements of a bird song, strategies to learn and memorize bird calls, and essential resources to get you started. The one thing you will need to do is to find your learning style. Your birding by ear style is the best way for you to listen, learn, and remember songs. The best strategy is to start small with a few calls of widespread and locally common birds. You naturally have more ready access to these birds, and by concentrating on this small number of species, you can begin to pick up details in the rhythm, pitch, patterns, and vocal quality of the songs. The small selection of common birds will become your building blocks. Each song you learn will provide insight into the next song you encounter. Let us go step by step. First, how to listen. Anyone who has a novel and intense experience, such as hearing many bird calling at the same time, could feel overwhelmed. To prevent this, you should focus on just one song. Next, don't try to get the whole song on one go. Get the clues, little by little. First, feel the rhythm of the song. Then. Note the pitch and then feel the tone. There is no hurry. Second, what to listen for. Once you can get a good, clear listen of a bird song, start noticing the following properties of the call or song. Rhythm. Is the song fast or slow? Is there a change in speed in the song or does it stay the same? Blue-headed vireos take their time when they sing while red-eyed vireos sing in a hurry. Pitch. Is it high or low? Do you hear a variation within the song? The pitch is best compared with other species. Note if the song is rising or falling. Smaller species typically have a higher voice, and large birds, like a raven or a duck, usually have deeper voices. Some birds rise as the black-throated blue warbler. Others descend like a viri. Repetition. Try to find the pattern of the call or song. Some birds repeat phrases before they move to a new note. Oven birds make the same sound many times in a row. While chestnut cider warblers say please, please, please three times before it ends in to meet you. Focal quality is the hardest but most critical ability to master for bird identification by ear. It is the description of a song. Many times I find descriptions and they make no sense to me until I hear the bird. You will have to find a way of describing the song. There are whistles, like the black cap chickadee. Some songs are flute-like, such as that of a hermit thrush. Others sound more like a buzz. For example, a savannah sparrow. And others are more like a hoot of the morning dove. Let us use the yellow warbler as an example of vocal quality. Listen to one of them. When it comes to rhythm, the song has a medium speed and it gets faster near the end. It's repetitive with a pattern. The pitch is emphatic and the vocal quality, it's sweet. And it can be described by the mnemonic, sweet, 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 sweeter than sweet. This brings me to the easiest birds to remember. Those, like the yellow warbler, that can be described with a mnemonic. A mnemonic is a phrase or a group of letters that helps you to remember a sound. The yellow warbler is the perfect example. Did you hear the 
sit in and sweep? If you didn't, don't worry. I didn't either until the third time. Here it goes again. There are other aspects that you will perceive more intuitively. Pay attention to speed, volume, and length of the songs. Some will be very fast, while others will be incredibly short, and some will be so loud you can hear them echoing through the forest. Now that we are aware of some key elements, we should consider our own differences in learning styles. Some people may need to listen to a live or recorded bird vocalization over and over again in order to memorize the calls. Others have to find the bird in the field and see it vocalizing to be able to remember. Some listeners are able to hear a sound just once to remember it. For most of us, the most important thing is to draw on the sounds we already know and consider what made them stick. The goal is to start finding similarities and differences between birds. Consider the similarities and differences in sounds produced by different birds. Variation in voice follows specific patterns. Related species tend to have similar calls and songs. For example, the majority of warblers sound like they are warbling. while the majority of thrushes sound like they have very elaborate whistles. You will have to try to remember the songs so you can match them with the original sound library afterwards. My final suggestions to improve the possibilities of remembering a call in the field is to try to create mnemonics that help you, like this bird. I would try and remember as Whippoorwill. Another strategy can be to imitate the call. You might discover that you are a brilliant bird imitator. You can also use technology. The majority of cell phones have incredibly directional microphones for recording the mysterious bird so you can listen again later at home for identification purposes. The top resources I will recommend are the following two. Seno Canto is for everyone. The interface is cleaner and much easier to navigate. The advanced search option allows you to specify the location. While this process requires a bit of learning, it's accessible and doable for a motivated student. The simple search works beautifully. It's easy to play the audio. The social aspect of it, where people upload songs, it's also very fun. An enthusiastic student could submit recordings for identification. The Merlin Bird app for Android and iOS is very good for fully able people or those of you who can have a helper. You can download local packages for birds. It has friendly navigation and calls and songs for all the species. One critical feature will be your best friend. The app gives you the choice to display all the birds of the likely birds at the place and time of year. It will use your localization data and local reports by other birders to filter out the species that you are unlikely to observe. If you can't find your call from a limited selection of birds, you can always have the app display all the bird species in the area, so you can work through the rest of the candidates. You can act birding by year less. We don't need to listen to it again. <laughs> okay, so that was um, some of the basic sort of breakdown of bird song and how you can start to uh, listen to different bird songs. And so it is, of course, a difficult um, task because humans aren't really as good at picking out sounds as um, as visual things. And sounds can also appear or sound different to different people. So they're really hard to describe with words and hard to remember after the fact, especially if you've uh, listened to some other recordings to try and match it up, you might sort of lose their memory quickly of what um, the bird actually sounded like. So it does take a lot of time to learn how a bird bite or to be able to do a bird bite ear. And it's something that, you know, I've been doing this for over, 
I don't know, probably 10 years now or, or so. And, you know, I'm still learning all the time. Um, so it's something that you should take slowly um, and be patient with yourself when you're starting to learn and uh, learning new species. And as you learn more, um, things will come easier. Um, and then as you learn even more, then you'll realize how much more there is still to learn. Um, it's really uh, quite quite a fun a fun task. <laughs> um, and then sometimes songs will just click after a certain amount of time. Um, so it really takes just uh, a lot of practice, but just start slow. Um, listen to the birds that are out in your yard all the time, um, out at the cabin, out your front window, that sort, of, that sort of thing, the ones that you're hearing consistently. So you can sort of get those key species uh, to memory before you start expanding on the ones that you're trying to learn. Um, and then as, of course, as you pay attention to bird songs, you'll go from having songs that are unfamiliar to being familiar enough and then being able to finally ID them. And it's really exciting. Um, another way that's helpful for some folks um, is to visualize songs with what are called spectrograms. So you can see here, th these are spectrograms. There's um, a hermit thrush is the top one and a savanna sparrow is the bottom one. And basically a spectrogram shows the volume of a sound um, and that's shown sort of in how dark the, the markings are. Um, if they're black or really dark, then it's louder. And if they're really pale, then it's softer. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like reading sheet music sort of thing um, and shows complexities of songs in a way that our ears don't necessarily pick up all the time. Um, so yes, as I said, it, it shows um, the volume, it shows the pitch. So that's kind of the notes and those can be shown up and down. Uh, so the notes go up and down and time appears along, uh, time goes along left to right. So you could see um, the duration of a song, like how many seconds the actual sound is lasting for, as well as uh, the pauses in between in between the different sections of song. And those can be really important as well um, for some species identification. Um, so I'll just let you listen to the hermit thrush should come first, I believe. So that was the, the hermit thrush on the top there. And you might've been able to follow along uh, by reading this spectrogram, those three kind of sections that it's saying. Um, and now we'll listen to the Savannah Sparrow on the bottom, see if you can pick out what part it's singing. Um, so it's quite different and it shows differently uh, in the spectrogram. So it's a really cool way of visualizing sound. So you probably already know some bird songs that are common around your house or cabin. And you don't even realize it. Um, and you might not necessarily know what species it is, but we are gonna go through some of these more familiar ones or more common species. And then I'll add in a few other common species um, as well. So we can practice noting the pitch, which is um, the notes that is singing, whether it's rising or falling, or if it's monotone, singing the same sound the whole time. Uh, we'll practice um, looking at the speed or repetition, whether it's a slow song or a fast song, and whether it's singing different notes or the same notes, uh, repeating things over and over. We'll go through the tone. Um, so these are more subjective words like whistles, um, whether it's hooting or cooing, um, sometimes it's buzzy, more like insect sound or measel. Um, and then we'll also, um, I'll show you a few mnemonics and I can't remember if I changed that to the right spelling or not from last year, <laughs> but those like, if you remember what Andres was saying are when you can put uh, human words to um, a bird song to try and remember it more easily. So this will just help you get more familiar 
with uh, practicing these different um, uh, different sort of categories while you're practicing birdsong on your own. And it will also help if you're reading birdsong descriptions in paper or online field guides, uh, because they often use this sort of terminology. And uh, so we can get a little familiar with it now. And these topics can also get uh, much more in depth than we're going to go into tonight. And I'll send some links along um, in a follow-up email from a web website called Earbirding uh, for anyone who wants to read more in-depth stuff about um, how to break down a bird song. So let's begin with the American robin. We're just going to go through these several species um, and talk about pitch, speed, repetition, tone, and uh, talk about a mnemonic if there is one that I know or use. And so let's listen to this American robin. So that's maybe a song that some of you are familiar with, uh, often considered the beginning of spring when you hear the robin singing. Um, and you can see also the spectrogram on the bottom uh, for, for the American robin. So the robin was singing multiple notes. They were rising and falling. Um, the speed was quite slow and steady. You could hear each individual note sing separately. And it wasn't repeating really the notes over and over again. It was singing different sounds um, in conjunction with each other. And the tone, I would say, is kind of a clear whistle. Um, and folks can uh, put other ideas in the chat if they want to um, about what sort of tone they think it had. And then a mnemonic that a lot of people use for American Robin is cheerily, cheer up, cheer up, cheerily, cheer up. So just uh, sings those jolly kind of things over and over. And I'll let you listen to the robin again. You can follow along in the spectrogram at the bottom if that helps. Okay, so that's the robin. We'll go on now to a very different bird, the American black duck. But probably another one that uh, many of you have heard making its uh, song or call before. So I'll let you listen to it. So it's got pretty much that quintessential duck quacking sound. Um, it's a monotone pitch, it's singing um, one, one pitch level the whole time, the same note over and over. Um, it's pretty slow. Again, you can count each individual note uh, separately. And it is repeating that same sound over and over again. So repetition is, uh, it is repeating things. Not really sure how to describe the tone of this one. Um, maybe rough or nasally. Um, again, you can put ideas in the chat if you have a different idea of how to describe the tone of that. And then a mnemonic for the American black duck is very simply quack. <laughs> um, and let's listen to it again. So, um, yeah, just me sort of not really being able to describe the tone of that is uh, very much why it's difficult to learn uh, bird songs sometimes and also to describe them because people can describe um, the tone of birds or um, these other these other categories in different ways, uh, depending on how it sounds to different people. Oh, you're listening to them again. Okay, <laughs> we'll move on to the white-throated sparrow. Um, I guess we should listen to him. Let's listen to the white-throated sparrow again. So 
So that was the white-throated sparrow. And when we talk about the pitch for that, first we had several monotone notes, the same note over and over. Um, and then we had some that, ri that were rising or falling. Again, we had a slow song. You could count each individual note. Um, and we did have some repetition. The same sound was repeated over and over, especially at the end. Uh, the tone for this one, I would call maybe a sweet whistle. Again, that's pretty subjective. And then uh, the mnemonic for the white-throated sparrow that's often used and we've talked about already tonight is, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Um, one thing that I really love about white-throated sparrow song, especially, uh, is later in the summer when the, the young birds have hatched and fledged and um, there are, some species actually will learn their songs by listening to adults singing. And so you'll have young birds um, practicing their singing, I guess, in the late summer. And it's really quite funny uh, because they're singing these really broken songs. They're not really quite sure how to do it yet. Um, they still need quite a bit of practice. But if you hear some kind of weird sounding birds in later summer, you might be having some young birds um, just learning. Okay, here's another one that um, probably a lot of you have heard before as well, the common loon. So let's listen to him. Oh, I guess it only goes once. I'll play it again. Oh, it's coming again. I don't know about you all, but I love that sound. It's just like summer in my heart. Um, <laughs> so the pitch for the common loon, this particular song that we listened to just now, they do have different, uh, different ones as well, is it was rising and then rising and falling at the end. Again, we had a slow song. You could uh, count each individual note. And it was repeating um, different notes over and over again. Uh, so it's, sorry, I guess it sang different notes at the beginning and then it repeated notes at the end. The tone, I guess, would maybe a bit eerie. Um, and I don't really know a mnemonic for the common loon, but it is a pretty distinct um, song. There's not a lot of other birds that sound quite like them. Um, We'll get into some songs that maybe aren't quite as familiar to people um, so we can explore some more different patterns of pitch, speed, repetition, and tone. Um, and for this one I particularly like because I think it says its own name. So this is the Savannah Sparrow. I'll let you listen to it. It's a little bit quieter so I'll play it again. Hopefully you were able to hear that from your computers. Um, um, so that one, um, I'll start with talking about the tone there. It's definitely kind of buzzy or more like insect-like um, rather than that really melodic sound that we've been hearing from these other species already. Um, the pitch of that one was monotone at the beginning with those, um, those quick notes at the beginning and then it fell down to lower tones. And the speed was slow again, we could count each individual note. And for repetition, it was singing the same note over and over again at the beginning and then different ones at the end. And as I said, this one says its own name. The mnemonic I use for this is sa 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 savanna. So here is a purple finch. Um, some of you might see these around if you have feeders up in the winter, they, they can stick around. Um, let's listen to the purple finch. It's 
So the purple finch sounds quite different from the ones we've already heard again. Um, the pitch for that is variable. It's really jumping up and down into different notes all over the place. And the speed is also fast. This time we can't really count notes very well as individual notes. It's just kind of burbling around. Um, the repetition is non-existent. So it's not repeating any notes over and over again. It's singing different notes. Um, so that is considered a warble. And the tone is bright or rich. Um, and then again, I don't know a mnemonic for the purple finch. Um, so that's tricky. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's take a look at the dark eyed junko here. So I'll play this for you. Okay, so um, for this one, the pitch, it's singing the same note all the time. So it's monotone. Uh, there's no variation in the note that is singing. The speed is quite fast. Again, you can't count each individual note. Um, and it is repeating the same note over and over again. And that's called a trill uh, when it, it repeats the same note over and over again quickly. And then the tone for Dark Eyed Junko is sort of, it has a bit of a ringing quality. So um, some species like different, um, Different individuals can have a lot of variation, as I mentioned. And so Dark Eyed Junko specifically, some will sing slower, some will sing faster, some will sing um, higher or lower, but they'll all have this kind of ringing quality. And that's why uh, Andres was saying that is one of the most important things, that the tone is one of the most important things, but also one of the hardest um, aspects of birdsong to, um, to learn. And that just takes a lot of time and practice. Um, again, I don't know a mnemonic for Dark Eye Junko, but it does have this very kind of distinct trill. So we'll listen once more. Okay, let's move on to the Fox Sparrow here. Um, I'll let you listen to it first. Um, so for the fox sparrow, the pitch rises and falls um, rather than being just one or the other. The speed is slow again, you can count each individual note, and it doesn't repeat notes really, it's singing um, a, different, a different note for each uh, instance. And then the tone again is a bit of a rich whistle maybe. Um, Catherine likes to say that fox bears sound like they're drunk, <laughs> um, so that might be useful for you to recognize their song. And my partner thinks that they sound sassy. So again, this is a kind of subjective thing, but um, once you find uh, something that you associate with the, the bird, um, it becomes much easier for, for you to recognize it. And that's often a, a kind of personal idea of it. Um, I don't know a mnemonic either for a fox sparrow, but let's listen to him once more. sassy little sparrow singing at you. Okay, let's move along to the black and white warbler. Um, you can listen to him first. So the pitch of the black and white warbler 
is alternating high and low. And a lot of people describe them as a squeaky wheel. So it's not really a mnemonic, but it is um, something to associate the sound with, um, like a wheel squeaking as it goes around in a circle. The speed is quite fast, uh, or I guess like medium fast, um, because it is a little hard to count the notes, but you could maybe do it. And it's repeating um, two note phrases. So up, down, up, down, up, down. It repeats that up and down over and over again. And the tone is squeaky, like that squeaky wheel that we talked about. Um, and the black and white warbler is a nice one to start learning for warblers because um, they're pretty common around even in towns and things like that. Um, so you'll probably come across this squeaky wheel sound this summer. Okay, um, I think this might be maybe the final song that I'll show you, um, but I'm not sure actually. Uh, this is the belted kingfisher. So it's a quite a distinct sound, I'll let you listen. So if you put that sound together with the location that you'll find a belted kingfisher, which is near water, um, there's not much else that will sound like it. So I'll let you listen once more. So the pitch there is monotone again, singing the same note over and over again. Uh, it's repeating that same note and it's um, quite quick as well. And the tone there is quite dry, a dry rattle. Um, and there's not really a mnemonic for that, but again, it doesn't sound like a lot of other different uh, species. So Belted Kingfisher is a really cool one to start learning. Okay, let's just quickly talk about technology and birdsong. So technology can be really helpful when you're learning to bird by ear because you can either record an unknown song um, to listen to later again, uh, or to bring, get someone else to, to listen to. And it avoids all this uncertainty about trying to describe the sound to another person, which can be, as we discussed, quite difficult. Um, so there's a few different ways that we can use technology. The first one is automated song identifying um, technology, like the Merlin app. And some of you might have tried this out before. Um, it's it's by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The app is called Merlin, and they have um, a sound ID section, which is the third one down there, uh, sound ID. And basically, you can put it out and start recording, and it will tell you what bird songs, what species are singing uh, that it can hear. And I will put a disclaimer on here. Merlin is quite good at ident identifying species, but it's not always correct. Um, but it is a really good way of starting to pick out similar species um, and getting sort of that uh, base information, I guess, or starting information so you can uh, investigate from there. But definitely don't take their identification with 100% accuracy. Um, and I mentioned already, yeah, that uh, sometimes it would be really helpful to make a recording on uh, your smartphone or a handheld recorder, that sort of thing to bring home with you. So you can use handheld recorders to record birdsong. The one that we have pictured here is a um, Zoom recorder. That's the ones that we use, um, our field staff uses, or some volunteers can borrow as well to do Atlas point counts. Um, this one is lovingly named Atticus. Uh, he travels around with us <laughs> in the summertime to do point counts. And these are, these are nice uh, because you can sort of set them up, record, record a sound, and then again, you can listen to it on your computer later. You can see those spectrograms um, depending what, what program you're using to visualize it as well. And then we could also use these things called automated recording units to record bird song. And uh, you can see one attached to that tree there. It's quite well camouflaged with two microphones sticking out the side. And they're really cool because um, 
You can program them ahead of time to turn on at specific times of day. You can leave them out in the woods for months at a time and they have enough battery power to do so. Um, and they'll turn on, record everything for however long you tell them to record and then they'll turn off again. And at the end of the season or however long you put them out for it, you collect them and you can download all of that data onto your computer. So it's really um, a cool way of finding out what's in a certain area without actually needing to be there every day. Okay, we're gonna go into um, a little quiz for fun here in the last few minutes. Um, I've put in five birds that I went over today with you. Um, and I'll, um, I'll play this song and then I'll open up uh, the pool for you guys to, to guess what it is. And um, I mean, just do your best. As we've been saying, bird song is really hard to learn. So uh, here's the first bird. Whoops, I think I cut it off. Should come again. Okay. And um, so what was that bird? Just leave that open for a couple more seconds if anyone else wants to get an answer in. Okay, I'll close it up here. We have a unanimous decision that that was a common loon. So um, that's a really common sound for everyone around uh, on the nearby water bodies. And so that's really cool to see that everybody knows who that is. So yeah, the common loon. Okay, I'll put up the next pool first and then play it. Okay, who is this bird? We got a lot of people answering this time. Nice. I'll close this up in a second. Okay. And so that was, oh, it's playing again. <laughs> it just keeps playing. That's an American Robin, um, like many of you said. I put in three options here that have the same sort of tone of uh, voice. Um, so this is kind of tricky. Um, but the American Robin does have those um, uh, phrases, I guess, with pauses in between and um, those up and down notes um, that are quite slow. The purple finch is a quick warbling and the hermit thrush, actually, we didn't even listen to it today. Um, so I won't try and describe it to you because <laughs> that's difficult. Okay. Let's uh, launch the next one and then I'll play it for you. Okay, I'll close this up in just one second. Oh, 
So, uh, yep, 82% of you got this correct. This is a black and white warbler. And that's the one that we described as a squeaky wheel. So it has the same repeating note squeaking up and down. Um, wonderful. Let's put up the next one here. Play it for you. Play that once more. Wow, 92% participation. Fantastic. So, um, most of you thought this was a white throated sparrow. And it is a white throated sparrow. Um, so he's the one that's singing, Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Um, and uh, probably plenty of you hear him around your homes uh, once they're back from migration, which will be coming up soon. Okay, I just have one final um, one final question here that I'll play for you. Play that again. Okay, I'll play it one more time. <laughs> I'll just leave this open for a couple more seconds for folks to put in answers. Okie dokie. Oh. So, um, this is a belted kingfisher. Um, so well done. To those of you who uh, got that one, the other ones uh, were tricky as well. Um, the belted kingfisher is that dry rattle. Um, and the Wilson snipe and rough grouse, as I mentioned, have uh, the sounds produced by their wings and tail feathers. Um, so it has a little bit of a different quality to it. Okay, I think um, that brings us just maybe to one final slide here. Um, with some resources, and I said, as I said, I'll I'll type these up and send them out in a um, follow up email. But I just wanted to mention um, some song libraries on the bottom left there. Um, those are really nice for sort of having a lot of different um, songs that you can listen to. You can look up usually by species or location, um, and just listen to different birds uh, to compare maybe with what you've heard outside. Um, and then there's also different um, resources online that uh, you can make quizzes in if you want to kind of quiz yourself at home. Um, Larkwire is a app that you can get for uh, a smartphone and I think maybe also for on on a desktop computer, I can't remember exactly. Um, and it's partially paid, but Dendroika is a website that is for free. You can put together little quizzes based on your location or groups of birds, uh, families of birds, even just individuals that you find difficult and want to compare. Um, and then Birdsong Hero is a super short free little game that um, compares spectrograms with, with uh, songs that you hear. And I will, I'll send all those out in a follow-up email. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight and for joining us for uh, the past several weeks if you've been coming out for all of those. And before we do go for the evening, um, we are hoping to get some feedback on tonight's webinar and the series in general. So um, Catherine, if you are able, could you put a link in the chat of just a super short survey that um, it'd be great if you guys could all fill out. Um, just for us to get some feedback on the things you liked or didn't like and um, some other info for us. Um, I'll also send that out in a follow-up email 
Uh, so don't worry if you can't get to it tonight. And again, if you're interested in donating um, as a token of appreciation, feel free to go to our website, uh, click Get Involved, and then uh, go to the Donate page. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and feel free to reach out by email to us at any time uh, about Atlas or Owl Survey or birds in general. And thanks everybody, it's been really great to have you all. Thank you, Jenna, you did a great job as always and lots and lots of thanks coming in on the chat. Um, as far as I can see, there's only one question. Um, we've obviously gone through a few while you've been talking, mostly mm -hmm. about birdsong and how it works and uh, the similarities and differences between uh, species, but somebody did ask um, what other virtual talks we'll do. Uh, so we will probably be taking a break during the summer because that's when we're out in the field. Uh, but this past fall, we did a series of uh, virtual webinars uh, where we invited bird researchers in Newfoundland to come in and share some of the work they're doing. So uh, rather than an overview of all species, it was a little bit more uh, question driven to learn a little bit more about some of our species here. And um, yeah, we'll, we may be able to do that again this fall if our uh, local bird re researchers um, will cooperate. Uh, Amira was wondering about, um, well, she asked a question about what song qualities females find attractive. And uh, I sort of said that varies from species to species. So uh, I don't, and, you know, it can be complexity, it can be song rate. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to add, add anything to that, Jenna. Yeah, I think uh, that does depend by species. But as you say, a lot, a lot of the time it's either uh, like frequency of singing or even like song repertoires or how many different versions of songs a male can sing. Um, and I'm sure there's other markers as well um, that I'm unfamiliar with, but those are two ones that I've heard of. Those are two very common ones. Yeah, and I mean, as I said, mm -hmm. I also mentioned that a lot of the time we don't know. We, we very mm -hmm. often don't really know what qualities uh, birds find attractive in mates, whether they be visual or auditory. Uh, and I remember learning this because I did um, graduate research on Western bluebirds, and I also looked at the genetics of their offspring and uh, and see just to see who was who was sleeping around basically. And uh, it was some of the males that I thought were the highest quality males, the brightest blue. They had the best boxes, and uh, yeah, I, I it was those males who were losing the most paternity in their broods. So it was you know often we're not really sure what they're evaluating. Um, and yes, if we do those, uh, if we are able to host those webinars with researchers again in the fall, we will certainly try to reach out to the people who, uh, who attended this series. It'll also be on our Facebook page and on our website again. Um, will we keep everyone on our email list? Uh, we don't actually put together an email list based on the people, like e the email list for each webinar is different, but we also don't want to send emails to the registration list for every webinar because then people who've come to all 12 would get 12 emails and they probably don't want that. Um, so the best way to sort of keep up to date with what's going on is to look on our Facebook, um, but you can also email us directly if you have questions. Um, yeah, did I miss anything? If anybody... <laughs> If anybody put a question in there that I missed while <laughs> talking, um, please ask it again. Oh, uh, Amira also asked about um, the begging sounds that baby birds make uh, because she was noticing and noting that they have a black Phoebe nesting and that the sounds that they made sounded surprisingly similar to the sounds you played from the flickers. Uh, and so we were sort of chatting a little bit about stereotyped calls and I don't, I've never actually done any research, but it seems to me that there are a lot of similarities in begging calls across species. Yeah, I would agree with that. I personally don't think I would be confident to identify many species by a begging call, uh, just because so many species sound so similar for that. Yeah, and yep. they are all quite high pitched and repetitive. Yes, yep. um, they're very insistent. As I said, they're louder than they <laughs> need to be, which is one of the big questions of, of bird research, why they are so loud when it leads predators to the nest. Um, but yeah, there are there are often stereotyped uh, calls. So another um, another very common stereotypical call is uh, 
the alarm calls the birds make. Those tend to be quite similar across species. And I discovered also with the bluebirds that you can play alarm calls that a bird has never heard before, but they still react as though it's an alarm call. So there are some sort of stereotype <laughs> noises. Um, there are some requests here for an email list. Maybe the thing to do would uh, would be for us to include in our follow-up email, um, you know, if you would like to be on an email distribution list for future announcements, maybe you could let us know um, because certainly we we cannot, we, yeah, we, we, it would be hard to do based on the, um, uh, yeah, based on all of the webinar registration lists that would be problematic. So perhaps just let us know if you would like to be on an email distribution list and we will we will put that together. Sounds good, yeah. Perfect. Uh, and I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, do we have a master email list for Birds Canada? Uh, you'd think, wouldn't you? Um, no, not necessarily. We do, we email people in different ways. So people who are registered through the Atlas uh, we actually email through our database, Nature Counts, and we do have a registration that way. They also, I believe, have a separate registration list or separate email list for people who have donated. Um, so, yeah, it, the emails, it, we're still working on syncing it up across the entire organization. Absolutely. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, just lots of thank yous. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for coming. It's been really, really great to see people come out and uh, and be interested um, in you know birds of Newfoundland. It's it's very exciting to have you all here. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks everybody for coming out, and we hope to see you again someday soon. Indeed. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Bye all.